Die Samen, die auf dem guten Land fallen, sind die, die das Wort hören und behalten in einem feinen, guten Herzen und bringen Frucht in Geduld. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Wir wollen den Gottesdienst anfangen mit Lied Nummer 343, 1 bis 3. Und deiner Güte gewiss werden. Wenn dich anfällt, so erhörst du 
Das ist für mich und die Liebste meiner Seele große Kraft. Du hast vergeben die Ungerechtigkeit deines Volkes, alle ihre Sünde hast du zugedeckt. Im Wechsel sprechen wir Worte aus Psalm 66. Wir singen. Oh, Entschuldigung, wir singen es. Lied Nummer 279.
Gott der Klarheit, in deiner Gegenwart erkennen wir, was gut ist. Schenk uns einen klaren Blick zu unterscheiden, was uns näher bringt zu dir und was unseren Glauben schwächt. Mach uns stark, nähe uns und lass uns wachsen hin zu dir. Durch Christus, deinen Sohn, der mit dir und dem Heiligen Geist ein Gott ist, von Ewigkeit zu Ewigkeit. Bitte nehmen Sie Platz. Die Lesung aus dem Alten Testament ist aus dem Buch des Propheten Jesaja, Kapitel 66, Verse 10 bis 14. Freut euch mit Jerusalem und seid fröhlich über die Stadt, alle, die ihr sie lieb habt. Freut euch mit ihr, alle, die ihr über sie traurig gewesen seid, denn nun dürft ihr saugen, und euch satt trinken an den Brüsten ihres Trostes. Denn nun dürft ihr reichlich trinken und euch erfreuen an der Fülle ihrer Herrlichkeit. Denn so spricht der Herr. Siehe, ich breite aus bei ihr den Frieden wie einen Strom und den Reichtum der Völker wie einen überströmenden Bach. Ihre Kinder sollen auf dem Arme getragen werden und auf den Knien wird man sie liebkosen. Ich will euch trösten, wie eine seine Mutter tröstet. Ja, ihr sollt an Jerusalem getröstet werden. Ihr werdet es sehen und euer Herz wird sich freuen und euer Gebein soll grünen wie Gras. Dann wird man erkennen die Hand des Herrn an seinen Knechten und den Zorn an seinen Feinden. Die Lesung aus dem Neuen Testament ist aus dem Brief des Paulus an die Galater, Kapitel 6, Verse 1 bis 10. Liebe Brüder, wenn ein Mensch etwa von einer Verfehlung ereilt wird, so helft ihm wieder zurecht mit sanftmütigem Geist. Ihr, die ihr geistlich seid. Und sieh auf dich selbst, dass du nicht auch versucht werdest. Einer trage des anderen Last, so werdet ihr das Gesetz Christi erfüllen. Denn wenn jemand meint, er sei etwas, obwohl er doch nichts ist, der betrügt sich selbst. Ein jeder aber prüfe sein eigenes Werk. Und dann wird er seinen Ruhm bei sich selbst haben und nicht gegenüber einem anderen. Denn ein jeder wird seine eigene Last tragen. Wer aber unterrichtet wird im Wort, der gebe dem, der ihn unterrichtet, Anteil an allem Guten. Irrt euch nicht, Gott lässt sich nicht schrotten. Denn was der Mensch sät, das wird er ernten. Wer auf sein Fleisch sät, der wird von dem Fleisch das Verderben ernten. Wer aber auf den Geist sät, der wird von dem Geist das ewige Leben ernten. Lasst uns aber Gutes tun und nicht müde werden, denn zu seiner Zeit werden wir auch ernten, wenn wir nicht nachlassen. Darum, solange wir noch Zeit haben, lasst uns Gutes tun an jedermann. Allermeist aber an des Glaubens genossen. Hier enden die Lesungen. Seventy others and 
sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people, and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its street and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Wir sprechen zusammen das apostolische Glaubensbekenntnis. Ich glaube an Gott, den Vater, den Allmächtigen, den Schöpfer des Himmels und der Erde und an Jesus Christus, Gottes eingeborenen Sohn, unseren Herrn, empfangen durch den Heiligen Geist, geboren von der Jungfrau Maria, gelitten unter Pontius Pilatus, gekreuzigt, gestorben und begraben, hinabgestiegen in das Reich des Todes, am dritten Tage auferstanden von den Toten, aufgefahren in den Himmel, er sitzt zu Rechten Gottes, des Allmächtigen Vaters. Von dort wird er kommen, zu richten die Lebenden und die Toten. Ich glaube an den Heiligen Geist, die heilige christliche Kirche, Gemeinschaft der Heiligen, Vergebung der Sünden, Auferstehung der Toten und das ewige Leben. Amen. Lied Nummer 395, 1 bis 3.
Let us pray together. God of wisdom, Spirit Sophia, enter our hearts and our minds as we gather to look at the word that you've already shared with us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Can you think of a time or times in your own life when you were made to feel vulnerable? I know I can. Being called into seminary as preparation for roster ministry would be one example in my own life. My whole adult life has been spent working in smaller nonprofits or educational systems, all for rather limited income. Not much at all by way of retirement savings, and scraping together a modest living in oil country where costs of living were skyrocketing. And here comes God. Come on over here, my friend. You might be able to work and pay the bills for the first bit of your degree, but eventually you'll have to give up what income you have and rely completely on loans, bursaries, donations, and stipends. I don't have a second income in the house. No one else to pay monthly expenses, let alone put anything aside for savings or emergencies or retirement. Choosing, the answer, choosing to answer the call to ministry is a huge, huge leap of faith. Talk about being vulnerable. I'm sure all of you have stories of how you have been called to step out into seasons of vulnerability at one time or another, perhaps multiple times. Perhaps you're there right now. It is a bit disconcerting to hear Jesus tell his followers to set aside pretty much everything you might think would be wise to take on a journey. Instead, he throws them upon a community's code of hospitality. He gets them gets them, he forces them, to take a chance on the goodwill, love, and resources of the people to look after these newbie disciples. No purses, no bags, no sandals. Now, depending on the theologian you ask, that last one may have been no extra sandals. For myself, at least that's what I hope he meant. I mean, he definitely wasn't speaking to a group of followers from midwinter Canada, now was he? Now, we've often shared in this church before about how deeply embedded these community hospitality codes were in, in Jesus' cultures, and, and remain today in many, many Middle Eastern cultures. Because in desert spaces, clean drinking water meant life or death. Denying someone a drink of water was a deeply grievous thing. Having even a meager meal to share when someone arrived was hugely important, whether guests had means to reciprocate or not. If someone was under your roof, they became your family, your responsibility. It was up to you to extend hospitality over the duration of their stay. And yet, Jesus already suspects, perhaps even already knows, that there will be situations where perhaps this hospitality will not be extended. Or, if it is extended initially, it might be withdrawn. Still, he sends them out anyway. He makes them vulnerable. Now, you and I, in the 21st century, we often become uncomfortable with this form of community relationship. We don't like feeling vulnerable. More than that, we don't like feeling like we are becoming burdens to anyone. Often, when I, when I sit with senior citizens, especially people living in assisted living or, or long-term care, one of the most common refrains that I will hear is that, I don't want to become a burden to my family. Now, if someone is preparing to die, whatever age that they're at, sometimes we'll do funeral preparation ahead of time. Why? 
Many folks don't want to leave burdens behind for their families in terms of funeral care. In so many areas of our lives, we balk at the very thought of ever being any kind of a burden to anyone. It's that distasteful for us. It causes that much anxiety. If Jesus were to ask us, Trinity Lutheran Church, today to go out without food, water, money, or any kind of extras, all to rely on the hospitality of our hosts, especially without letting those hosts know that they're going to be hosts for us, I think many of us would really, really struggle. We would never want to even attempt such a thing unless we had the honor and privilege of reciprocating, inviting people to our houses for a meal, sharing resources from our bank accounts. Now, I'm all for reciprocity. Having spaces for everyone to share in our gifts together as we create community. But I, I want to challenge us to examine a little bit what our own reactions to this kind of vulnerable build, let me try that again, vulnerability really are. What are these reactions truly rooted in? Perhaps, perhaps some of us are living under this tyranny of, of debt pressure. If someone does a kindness for us, we suddenly feel obligated to return the favor in equal or greater measure. I thoroughly understand the impulse, but true reciprocity acts out of love for God and the community not necessarily out of some fear that we owe people or that others owe us. Perhaps our sense of independence gets in the way. This trait is especially strong in more affluent communities, while the research and the polls are to be believed. If we have more means to do things for our own selves, we become more agitated and uncomfortable when we need to rely on the hospitality of other people. It often seems that the more material resources we acquire, the more walls we can put up against the world. We have more tools to hide our vulnerabilities. But true reciprocity acknowledges that everyone needs to be able to both serve and to be served mutually. Maybe we've just been disappointed one too many times. Maybe we felt manipulated or used up. It's exhausting being taken for a ride and so often to protect ourselves, we default to just doing everything for ourselves. At the very least, if we screw up, it's only ourselves we are forced to contend with. But true reciprocity grows in wisdom as we experience community, and it also chooses to continue to risk participating in that community somehow. I can't tell you what God might be urging you to leave behind as you step out into the world this week. I might challenge us all, however, myself included, to dare to look at what things we rely on for safety and security. These things that aren't wrong, but perhaps may have gotten in the way of experiencing the love and hospitality of God's beloved community. What might I need to let go of? For some of us, it might literally be material things like we see in our gospel today. For others of us, it might be more emotional or spiritual things that we carry around with us. But leaving behind our security measures is only a first step. We aren't doing this as an action unto itself. 
We leave behind these things as a way to choose a vulnerability, as a way to throw ourselves upon the hospitality of other people. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty terrifying. Goes against a whole lot of our grains. What if people don't reciprocate? What if our needs aren't met? What if we're rejected? What if I can't do it? What if I fail? On the other hand, how can we, people of God, truly experience what God is doing in the world unless we allow the beloved community around us to be Christ to us? A couple of weeks ago, I noticed a new face sitting out on the front steps of our church one morning. And my little dog, Piper, hopped up to her and they shared a bit of a moment. I introduced myself and I asked their name. She said her name was Minnie. Now she was drawing on some small slips of paper and then every so often, she would toss one aside and let it fly, in the way, fly away in the wind. Now, at first I was a little bit put out, because, you know, littering. <laughs> but she quickly explained that she was a very shy person. But she wanted to make sure that somehow she had the chance to leave the world a better place. By creating artwork and little messages of hope that she would write underneath, and releasing these on the wind, she would whisper a quick blessing that whoever picked it up would receive that blessing and be reminded of how loved they are and find a reason to carry on that day. What a gift! She appeared to me to have very little in the world, and yet even in the littleness of material wealth, here she was thinking of her community and wanting to share love in ways that she felt she could. I confess, I was deeply humbled. Jesus doesn't leave us stranded in this call to vulnerability. It's a way for God to help break down our own barriers and walls that prevent us from being deeply interconnected in our world. I have no doubt that some of this larger group of disciples we read about today we're pretty anxious about what Jesus was asking of them. But sit with this a minute, my friends. How can we experience God in the world if we refuse to allow people around us their gifts of hospitality? Whether we need to control all aspects of service or whether we're afraid, doesn't matter. In the end, we may lose out on the brilliant expressions of God's kingdom. It's true. Jesus' followers had a message that the kingdom of God was near. But so did the people who hosted them. The community also had a message. Here, beloved. Take bread. Here, beloved. Have a glass of cool water. Here, beloved, here's a cool, soft space for you to lay down and rest. Becoming vulnerable helps us accept the truth that God's kingdom is for everyone and has been for a very, very long time. Come, lay down what we must at the foot of the cross and take a chance on the love of God and community. These gifts are for you, too. Amen. As we depart today, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen.
Lied Nummer 322, 1 bis 4.
receive God's blessing today. May the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance and bring you God's peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gottesdienst beenden mit dem Ausgangslied Nummer 322, 7 bis 9.